Welcome to Sound Bites, hosted by registered dietitian nutritionist Melissa Joy Dobbins. Let's delve into the science, the psychology, and the strategies behind good food and nutrition. Hello, and welcome back to the Sound Bites Podcast. I'm your host, Melissa Joy Dobbins. Did you know that nearly half of all American adults are living with some form of cardiovascular disease, and 10% of Americans have type 2 diabetes? So that makes it even more important than ever that people have accurate, evidence-based nutrition advice to support a healthy diet. Today's episode is about new diabetes and heart health research regarding lean, unprocessed beef and the scientific evidence on red meat in general, but also a deep dive into different kinds of research, such as epidemiology versus randomized control trials, and the limitations of observational evidence, as well as some thoughts on industry-funded research. Now, this podcast is a collaboration between Sound Bites and Beef It's What's for Dinner, a contractor to the Beef Checkoff. As a compensated member of the Beef Expert Bureau, on behalf of the Beef Checkoff, my role is to share the science and support for beef's role in a healthy diet. My guest today is Dr. Kevin Mackey. He's an adjunct professor at Indiana University School of Public Health in the Department of Applied Health Science. Also, he's a chief scientist with Midwest Biomedical Research and president-elect of the National Lipid Association. Dr. Mackey specializes in the design and conduct of clinical studies in human nutrition, metabolism, and chronic disease risk factor management. He has participated in more than 300 clinical trials and observational studies as an investigator, consultant, or statistician, and published more than 250 scientific papers, books, and book chapters. Welcome to the show, Dr. Mackey. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I am looking forward to our conversation, but before we dive into the topics that I mentioned, I would like to hear a little bit more about the work you currently do maybe a little bit more about your background and any disclosures that you might have. Sure. Well, we can start with the disclosures. So I do research uh, as my main job, and I accept research funding from industry, from government sources, from foundations, and so forth. I want to make it clear that when I accept research funding from industry, as an example, what I do is I say I can guarantee the process. I cannot guarantee the results. And I've worked very hard over many years to develop a reputation as someone who's going to do research in a solid, scientifically sound manner, and definitely not someone who you can come to to say, I'd like to get this result, you know, help me get that. With regard to my background, I'm an epidemiologist by training, but I also have training in human nutrition and human physiology. And my focus for most of my career has been on looking at the relationships between risk factors for diabetes and risk factors for heart disease, and then understanding how we can intervene with lifestyle and pharmaceutical interventions, both to prevent heart disease and diabetes and to manage cardiometabolic diseases when they're present. Thank you. Yes. And as a certified diabetes educator, I'm especially interested in the work you're doing regarding diabetes. So let's talk about this new research on diabetes and heart health regarding lean, unprocessed beef. And by the way, this research was funded by the Beef Checkoff. And it's my understanding that the Beef Checkoff provided comments on early aspects of the study design. But the substance and conclusions are those of the authors alone, kind of reiterating what you had just said, basically, you know, funding the research, but not funding the results. But you could speak more specifically to that because you are the primary author on this study. Sure. We ran a controlled feeding study. So in this study, we had two diet periods. And during one of the diet periods, people followed a USDA healthy eating pattern diet. And they did that with all of the food they consumed during that month being provided by us. So we had food delivered to people's homes. They ate only that food. If they cheated, then we wanted them to record that and 
tell us if they ate something that they weren't supposed to have eaten. We also ask them to let us know if they failed to eat anything that we gave them. And most people were very highly compliant. They did everything that we asked them to do. And that was a one-month period. And then for another one-month period, they followed a similar diet, but with the addition of 5.3 ounces per day of lean, unprocessed beef. And our subjects were people who had risk factors for type 2 diabetes. So they either had pre-diabetes or they had metabolic syndrome, which is a risk factor for diabetes. So these were people at increased risk for developing type 2 diabetes. We gave them all of the food they ate for these two dietary periods, and it was a crossover design. So for one period, they had one diet, and then they crossed over and had the other diet for the other period. Half did it in one order, lean beef, then no lean beef, or less lean beef, I should say. And then the other half had the opposite order. So this is kind of the gold standard with regard to evaluating the effects of diet on risk factors for cardiometabolic diseases in that all of the food was provided for the subjects. So we had control over at least the dietary aspects of their lifestyle. That's the controlled feeding wording means that you provided all of the food and you were able to kind of control for some of the other factors that would have been a problem if you just said, here, eat what you normally eat, but add this to your diet. That's the controlled feeding part, right? Exactly. So with this kind of a design, uh, you don't have the problem that you sometimes run into and we have run into in some other studies in that if you're giving somebody something to eat and you're asking them to replace things in their diet, some people may replace one thing, other people may replace other things, and you don't have that same level of control that you have when all of the foods that people consume are provided by the investigators. Okay. And then you had mentioned that crossover, I believe you said the crossover with the washout in between. And that's something that helps you look at the same individual's risk factors being compared between the two diets. Can you speak a little bit more about that? Sure. With a crossover design, each person is acting as his or her own control. And so we were comparing these two diets, a control diet that was a healthy USDA type eating pattern. And then the same type of eating pattern where some of the carbohydrate in the diet, mainly carbohydrate from refined starches, had been replaced with lean beef. And we should back up a little bit. How many participants were in the study? How many were men and women? You said that they're at risk for type 2 diabetes, but maybe we could talk a little bit more about who they were in that respect. Sure. We had 33 subjects, and most of our subjects were women. There were seven men. The rest were women. All of the subjects had risk factors for diabetes. Specifically, they had pre-diabetes, which meant either elevated fasting glucose or elevated glycated hemoglobin, or they had metabolic syndrome. And to qualify for that, you have to have at least three of five risk markers, things like increased waist circumference, high triglycerides, increased blood pressure, low HDL cholesterol, and you have to have at least three of the five components to be considered uh, to have the metabolic syndrome. Okay. How long was the study? I know you mentioned part of it, but from beginning to end and the, the different components. So each person was on one diet for a month, then off for at least a month, and then they were on the other diet for a one-month period. Okay. And let's talk specifically before we get into what the results were, the, the takeaways. You mentioned it's beef, but I know it's lean, unprocessed beef. Do you want to speak to that aspect? Because I think sometimes when we just say beef, a lot of different things kind of get lumped into that. Sure. That is an issue in that with lots of the observational evidence, we're trying to get at what people have been eating habitually. And so we use things like food frequency questionnaires and so forth, and we try and quantify the amount of meat that's being consumed, different types of meat, different levels of fat in the meat that's being consumed, and so forth. And in observational studies, it's very difficult often to 
get a clear picture of what a person is eating habitually. In a clinical trial, on the other hand, where we're providing all of the food, we know exactly what's being consumed. So we were focusing on the effects on the risk factor profile for cardiometabolic diseases of lean, unprocessed meat. And so we didn't look at effects of processed meat, for instance, or meat that is not lean, that's higher in fat. And so we can't speak to those issues. We can only speak to the effects of adding lean, unprocessed meat to a healthy dietary pattern. Okay. So to recap, both groups had the same diet, except for the one group had additional 5.3 ounces of lean unprocessed beef per day, and that was usually in place of refined starches. Is that correct? Exactly correct. Okay. So tell us what some of the takeaways and the findings were. Well, I want to emphasize that we used a fairly large amount of lean beef. And the reason we did that is that if there was any adverse effect of eating that much lean beef, we wanted to see it. We wanted to have an extreme enough level of intake that if anything was going to happen, any adverse effect was going to occur, that we'd pick it up. Okay. That, you know, wouldn't be a matter of, well, they didn't eat enough to really show. It was too conservative of a portion. and Exactly. And, you know, one of the messages is I'm not out to promote, you know, eat this level of lean beef each day. Instead, this was a kind of proof of concept study to look at the effects of adding a relatively large amount of lean beef to the diet. And my recommendation to people is that, you know, they should follow the dietary guidelines for Americans in terms of consumption of, you know, red meat, poultry, eggs, animal proteins, plant proteins, etc. So specifically, what we did is we looked at the cardiometabolic risk factor profile. So that includes things like insulin sensitivity, which is one of the main factors that relates to risk of developing diabetes. And I'll just talk a little bit about that for a moment. For most people who develop diabetes, they go through a period of years or decades where they have insulin resistance, and that means that their tissues don't respond well to insulin. And so what their bodies need to do is produce more insulin to get glucose that is absorbed from the GI tract after a person consumes a meal, and that glucose can come from sugars and starches. And the glucose gets into the bloodstream, and if enough of it is there, you need insulin to help move that glucose from the bloodstream into the tissues. And for people with insulin resistance, their tissues don't respond very well. And so as a result, they need to produce more insulin to get that glucose out of the blood and into the tissues. And that means the pancreas, which produces insulin, is working double time or triple time after every meal. And eventually it starts to burn out and it starts to lose the ability to produce enough insulin to get the glucose from the bloodstream into the cells. And the result is that the person develops prediabetes and then eventually, if that goes on long enough, uh, type 2 diabetes. So insulin resistance or insulin sensitivity was our primary outcome and we used an intravenous glucose tolerance test to evaluate the level of insulin sensitivity. And we had another measure called HOMA insulin sensitivity, which is based on fasting levels of glucose and insulin in the bloodstream. And so we had multiple measures, and they both showed the same thing, which is that there was no impact of adding the beef to the healthy dietary pattern with regard to markers like insulin sensitivity and other markers for risk of diabetes and also markers for risk for cardiovascular disease. Okay. Thank you for speaking to the insulin sensitivity and uh, insulin resistance. That was a great explanation. So explain more then about the results. I understand that there was no statistically significant difference, but can you take us through that. 
Sure. The only thing that we found where there was a statistically significant difference was that there was a shift toward more cholesterol being carried by larger LDL particles. And that's potentially favorable. And so I don't want to make too much of that when I say it's potentially favorable. We don't really fully understand what the clinical implications are. But in general, smaller LDL particles are thought to be more harmful for a variety of reasons. And so what we saw with adding the lean beef to the healthy dietary pattern was a shift toward larger LDL particles. We didn't see any significant differences with regard to the levels of cholesterol in the blood overall. Mm -hmm. So there was no statistically significant difference for LDL cholesterol, non-HDL cholesterol, HDL cholesterol, triglycerides, and other risk markers such as uh, LDL particle concentration and so forth. And so what we observed was very modestly higher, but not statistically significantly higher LDL cholesterol. Mm -hmm. And that's really consistent with expectations because we know that when you have more dietary cholesterol, it does tend to modestly raise the LDL cholesterol level. The difference between the diets was 3%. And that 3% difference was not statistically significant. So, you know, we can't rule out chance, but I would say it's more or less consistent with our expectations that somewhat higher dietary cholesterol would lead to slightly but not significantly higher LDL cholesterol. Great. And the fact that there were no statistically significant differences between the diets in this case is kind of what a person who wants to include lean unprocessed beef in their diet would be hoping for is that if they include it up to that amount, which again, as you said, is more than you kind of went on the high end just to make sure we weren't being too conservative and missing some potential effect. But we would hope that including lean unprocessed beef in a healthy diet would not cause any cardiometabolic health changes. Exactly. So we had done previous studies uh, going back now 20-ish years on the effects of consuming lean beef as compared to, or in in that study uh, that I was speaking of in particular, was really lean red meat, which was partly beef and partly other types of red meat, compared to poultry, for instance. And we found no differences. Other people have found no differences. So there's this view that if you eat beef or other types of red meat, that it's going to raise your cholesterol level and it's going to increase your risk for cardiovascular disease. And in part, this is driven by results from observational studies because in observational studies, people who eat more red meat or beef do tend to have somewhat higher risk for heart disease and type 2 diabetes But it's not clear that that's because of the beef or other red meat that they're consuming because people who eat a lot of red meat are different in many respects from people who eat little red meat. And so you have this problem that you don't know whether it's the red meat they're consuming that is creating an issue or whether it's other lifestyle factors that may be correlated with red meat consumption. I like to use this example of vitamin E to illustrate kind of the reverse of that. About 20, 25 years ago, most cardiologists reported that they were taking a vitamin E supplement because they believed, based on results from observational studies, that consuming more vitamin E would lower the risk for cardiovascular disease. And there were observational studies that showed that higher vitamin E intake and specifically supplemental vitamin E was associated with lower risk for coronary heart disease. Well, then randomized controlled trials were done, and what they showed is no difference between a placebo group and a vitamin E supplement group with regard to cardiovascular risk. So, you know, why would it be that the observational studies would suggest that vitamin E might be protective? Well, the reason is that people who were taking vitamin E supplements had healthier lifestyles. Mm -hmm. They were generally 
had lower body mass index, higher education, higher access and use of the healthcare system, better diets, et cetera, et cetera. And so it wasn't probably the vitamin E. The vitamin E was a marker mm. for healthy lifestyle habits. Well, one of the issues you have with observational studies when it comes to red meat consumption is that it's possible that some or all of the association between red meat consumption and risk for cardiometabolic disease, like heart disease, like type 2 diabetes, could be due to other lifestyle factors that are associated with higher meat consumption. And so it's hard to work out those relationships. And there are observational studies that show an association between more red meat consumption and higher risk for cardiometabolic diseases like heart disease and diabetes. But it's not at all clear to me anyway that that is a causal relationship. It could be that higher red meat consumption is associated with other lifestyle factors that are really driving the higher risk for cardiovascular disease and type 2 diabetes. And we're going to talk more in depth about observational research, observational evidence, but to put a finer point on it, as you said, observational research can illustrate a relationship or a correlation, but it can't illustrate cause and effect. And it's my understanding that relatively few studies have directly assessed the influence of specific foods like red meat or beef or dietary patterns on insulin sensitivity. And most of those recommendations have been based on observational evidence. True. And I think insulin sensitivity is an important thing to measure and to evaluate the impacts of lifestyle factors on because insulin resistance, or in other words, low insulin sensitivity, is a risk factor for both heart disease and diabetes. And so it's kind of a shame that we haven't had more studies to evaluate the influences of lifestyle interventions on insulin sensitivity. And so that's been one of the areas where I've been doing work for decades now, trying to evaluate how lifestyle factors influence insulin sensitivity. And just like cholesterol is a risk factor for cardiovascular disease, high blood pressure is a risk factor for cardiovascular disease, insulin resistance is a risk factor for diabetes and cardiovascular disease. And so I really think we need to understand better what influences there are, especially those things that we can change, like diet, on insulin sensitivity, because that might translate into differences in risk of both heart disease and diabetes. Mm -hmm. And we're going to talk more specifically about the pros and cons of observational research and randomized control trials. You're going to explain all of that for us. But before we get to that, let's wrap up the main takeaway from this research and anything else you wanted to add regarding that. And then also I'm curious is how you see this study fitting into the overall scientific evidence on red meat in general. Sure. I think the results from this study confirm results from previous studies that we and others have done that basically support the view that you can include lean red meat in a healthy dietary pattern without having an adverse effect on the cardiometabolic risk factor profile. Now, People will ask, well, are there other things that uh, might be influenced by eating red meat, like TMAO is something that's been in the news a lot? And the answer is, I can't rule that out. And, you know, we didn't study that, so I can't really address that issue specifically. But we know what the major risk factors are for cardiovascular disease and type 2 diabetes. And our study and others have shown that. There's no adverse effect of a reasonable level of consumption of lean red meat on the risk factor profile for heart disease and diabetes. And so if you are talking about any kind of dietary intervention, the question is always compared to what? And, you know, some people will argue that, well, you know, what you should have done is compared your beef instead of using it as a replacement for carbohydrate. You should have compared beef protein to, say, plant protein. And that's a different study. It's a very reasonable type of study. It's not the study that we did. 
And also, I think if you look at most Americans, about 95% of Americans eat some form of meat or poultry or fish daily. And so what we were trying to do is look at the way most Americans eat and look at the influence of adding additional lean beef to a healthy dietary pattern. And I think the take-home message is the results from our study and others suggest that lean red meat can be incorporated into a healthy dietary pattern without adversely affecting risk factors for heart disease or diabetes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like the study that you did is a little, this might not be the right terminology, but a little bit more simplified or focused on that one change, the additional 5.3 ounces of lean beef versus almost looking at two things. Is it beef or is it plant proteins? It, that sounds like it starts getting a little bit more complex then. It does get more complex. And, you know, I'll say that there are studies that have compared, you know, white meat, red meat, and plant protein as, or I should say, non-meat, which in the particular study I'm thinking of was a mixture of plant protein and dairy protein. So there's more to learn about the various dietary options. Whenever you eat more of one thing, you're going to eat less of something else. And so we still have a lot to learn about what happens when you replace this for that. And in our particular study, we were asking a very specific question. What happens when you replace some of the refined starches in the diet with lean beef? And so we have that answer, but we certainly have not answered all of the important questions. Mm -hmm. Right. And one more thing, you know, we often hear that people are eating too much meat or too much protein. We kind of hear both. What do you say when, when you hear that from a research standpoint and a public health standpoint? How do you respond to that? Well, the way I respond is that if you look at the average American diet, in general, people are not eating more than the recommended amount of red meat. So the recommendation is basically 3.7 ounces uh, per day, up to, I should say, 3.7 ounces per day of protein foods uh, like meat, poultry, and eggs. And this is the dietary guidelines recommendations. This is from the dietary guidelines, yes. And so right now, Americans' consumption of red meat is roughly, I should say unprocessed red meat, I believe, is roughly 1.7 or 1.8 ounces per day. That's within the recommendations on average. But there are subgroups in the population that are eating quite a bit more than that and other subgroups in the population that are eating less than that. So especially among some older individuals who are losing body mass, uh, they might uh, do well to eat more protein. And, you know, red meat is one source of protein that is a reasonable option. And then there are other groups, uh, like some groups of young men who are eating quite a bit more than is recommended. And so I would say for the average person, consuming red meat, say three times or four times a week as part of a healthy dietary pattern is very reasonable. And there's nothing in our research that would suggest that that would have any adverse effects on health. Right. And again, you know, the key is lean, lean red meat, lean beef. We know that it's a nutrient rich food. And there's so many more lean cuts of beef available today than there used to be. So that's something that I always like to remind people. Okay. Anything else about scientific evidence on red meat in general before we dive into different types of research and the pros and cons? Sure. I'll just say one caveat, which is that I think it's prudent to avoid charring meat, you know, overcooking meat, because especially charring of meat can produce compounds that are potentially carcinogenic. And so, you know, my recommendation is just to avoid charring or overcooking of meat. And so normal cooking methods that, you know, don't leave you with something close to a charcoal briquette <laughs> are preferred. And I think that with regard to the way most people eat most meat, it's fine. But I, you know, would throw in the caveat that charring is probably not recommended or is not recommended. Thank you for that reminder. And it is grilling season. And I'll include some resources in my show notes at soundbitesrd.com to make sure that you are doing that safely. I know one tip is to use a marinade. 
and obviously just, you know, get it off the grill before you overcook it. I mean, nobody wants overcooked meat anyway. I have a fond uh, family memory growing up when my dad kind of overdid the chicken on the grill and my brother literally said, I'm not going to eat this because I can write my name on the plate, (laughs) on the paper (laughs) plate. And oh, that did not go over very well. But (laughs) we tried to get dad not to burn the chicken anymore after that. Okay, well, let's talk about the different kinds of research. You can kind of lead the discussion on this. If you want to talk about like the hierarchy, start with the gold standard or whichever way you want to start. You've already articulated some of the differences and pros and cons, but I really want to make clear to myself and our listeners the role of different types of research and why certain types are better than others in some ways, but also why we can't just do all randomized control trials. Sure. The absolute gold standard is the randomized controlled trial of a dietary intervention that would evaluate the effects of that intervention on actual disease incidents. Unfortunately, we have relatively few of these. So the PREDIMED study is an example where they took people who had risk factors for cardiovascular disease and they assigned them to three diets, what they called a low-fat dietary pattern and then two Mediterranean diet patterns, one that emphasized nuts, one that emphasized olive oil, and then follow them over time to see how many heart attacks, strokes, and other cardiovascular events there were. So that's the gold standard. Unfortunately, in nutrition, we have very few of those. For pharmaceuticals, like statin drugs, for instance, we have lots of those trials to show that lowering cholesterol with a statin drug lowers the risk for cardiovascular disease, In nutrition, we have relatively few of those. And so for disease incidents, we mostly have observational studies where there's no intervention. You just take a group of people, you categorize them based on some risk factor or some factor that you think might be related to disease incidents, and then you follow them over time. So as an example, using red meat, you might have people at baseline take a diet or food frequency questionnaire and then use the results from that food frequency questionnaire to identify those who have high red meat intake, moderate red meat intake, or low red meat intake, and then follow them over time to see if the level of red meat intake is associated with incidence of cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, etc. And so the real issue with that type of study is that there are always other factors that could influence that relationship. And one type of thing is bias. So, you know, there may be a healthy or an unhealthy user bias. So people who eat a lot of red meat might have unhealthy lifestyle characteristics. People who eat very little red meat might have more healthy lifestyle characteristics. And so you might show an association between red meat consumption and risk for heart disease or diabetes that might not be due to the red meat consumption. It might be due to other lifestyle factors that are associated with red meat consumption. And we've seen this. I mentioned vitamin E earlier. We've seen this with postmenopausal estrogen progestin therapy. We've seen it in a variety of ways where you find associations in observational studies, and then they, in some cases, turn out to be good indications of what happens in randomized controlled trials. And in other cases, that turns out not to be true. So for observational studies, they're very useful. I'm trained as an epidemiologist, so observational studies are very important, and that's mainly what epidemiologists do. But on the other hand, I also recognize that because of the potential for bias and confounding, randomized controlled trials usually, not always, provide a more reliable answer to those questions, but we can't study everything in randomized controlled trials. It's just not practical. It's very expensive to study some things. In some instances, the effects of diet may accumulate over many years, and so it's cost prohibitive or impractical to study people for that long a period. And then there are other things that it would be unethical to study in randomized controlled trials. I would say that We'll never have randomized controlled trials of cigarette smoking or parachutes. So (laughs) with cigarette smoking, you know, you can't take a group of, say, teenagers 
randomly assign these folks to smoke and these folks not to and see how things turn out. That would be unethical. Right. And it would be very hard to find volunteers for a randomized controlled trial to demonstrate the efficacy of parachutes mm. for preventing deceleration trauma. <laughs> Just, that's a great example. Uh, <laughs> is it fair to say that epidemiology and observational research can oftentimes help us determine what might be a good randomized control trial. Give us some information to say, hmm, this begs the question of how can we look at this more closely through randomized control trial? Yeah, traditionally, observational evidence has been mainly used for hypothesis generation. And then whenever possible, you want to test those hypotheses with randomized controlled trials. But as I said, you can't always do that in terms of disease incidence. And so what you're often left with for dietary recommendations is evaluating two types of evidence, prospective cohort studies as an observational study design that gives us some evidence uh, for a diet disease association, and then randomized controlled trials of risk factors or biomarkers that are associated with risk. So for cardiovascular disease, that would be things like lipid levels, such as LDL cholesterol, blood pressure, markers of inflammation, and so forth. And for diabetes, the main risk factors would be body weight and insulin sensitivity. And so for dietary recommendations, we're often left with observational studies and then randomized controlled trials of risk markers that we hope will be accurate predictors of the effect of that dietary factor on disease incidence, but we often don't have much in the way of randomized controlled trials of disease incidence. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned prospective cohort. Can you explain in more detail what that means? That's moving forward and looking at subjects in a certain way. Can you explain that? Sure. With a prospective cohort study, what you're doing is you're taking a group of people, you're measuring things in those people, and then you kind of sit back in most cases and wait for bad things to happen to the people in your cohort. The more events they have, the more ability they'll have to identify what predictors are present for those events. And so viewed through that lens, epidemiology is a little bit ghoulish. And so if you want to scare kids at Halloween, you dress up as an epidemiologist. <laughs> but, you know, essentially the study design is you measure things and then you see if those things that you measured predict outcomes, predict what happens to people over time. And usually the outcomes that we're predicting are events, disease events like new onset diabetes new heart attacks, new strokes, and so forth. Just as an aside note, because then the other type of epidemiology is the retrospective, like looking back, is that what it's called? Sure. Another type of epidemiologic study design or observational study design is the case control study. So with a case control study, you take people who have the disease and then people who don't have the disease, and then you look back into their pasts to see if there are any factors you can identify that are more commonly associated uh, with the disease or that are more common or more frequent in those with the disease than those without. And case control studies are more subject to bias and confounding than prospective cohort studies. And prospective cohort studies are more subject to bias and confounding than randomized controlled trials. Mm -hmm. So that leads me to ask you about this article you wrote, Limitations of Observational Evidence, Implications for Evidence-Based Dietary Recommendations. And your co-authors were Joanne Slavin, Tia Raines, and Penny Chris Etherton, some great company you're keeping there. And this was in Advances in Nutrition. Can you talk to me about this article and some of your thoughts that you share that we haven't touched on yet and some of the takeaways with regard to nutrition research? So I have been somewhat concerned that over the years, there has been too much emphasis on observational evidence for driving dietary recommendations. And with regard to observational evidence, it's very important 
But my view is that we should be a little more cautious when we make recommendations to identify those recommendations that are supported by both observational evidence and randomized controlled trials as compared to those recommendations that are based mainly on observational evidence. Because, as I mentioned earlier, there have been a number of cases where observational studies have kind of led us down the wrong path or to conclusions that couldn't be confirmed later in randomized controlled trials. And so we wrote this paper to emphasize some of the limitations, not to say that there's no place for observational studies. I absolutely believe that there is, and I'm trained as an epidemiologist, and so you know I'm personally involved in observational studies. I don't want to give the impression that uh, they're unreliable. In most cases, they are giving us the right answer. In some cases, they're not. And I think we just need to be a little more careful about acknowledging the uncertainty when the evidence we have is primarily from observational studies. And so the question is why observational studies sometimes lead us down the wrong path. And there are a whole host of reasons for this. Uh, One of the reasons is that when we're measuring diet, we don't measure it very precisely. And so when you're asking someone, what have you eaten in the last three months, and they're filling out a food frequency questionnaire, that's a very crude measurement. And so with regard to measuring the exposure, that is the thing that we think might be related to disease incidence, either in a favorable or unfavorable way, we're doing that crudely. And then other dietary factors that could also influence disease incidence are measured very crudely. And then if you think about what other factors beyond diet influence disease incidence, it's a whole host of things such as physical activity and psychosocial stress and socioeconomic status and so forth. And we don't measure many of these things very precisely either. So you've got a whole variety of reasons that observational evidence can at times, not most of the time, but just a small percentage of the time, give us answers that don't hold up in randomized controlled trials. And there have been a you know, number of these over the years. Some things that look very promising in observational studies turned out uh, when tested in randomized controlled trials not to show the benefits that have been hoped for. And some things that look very promising in observational studies that we thought might have adverse effects turned out not to have those adverse effects. So because of that, I believe that we should be a little more reticent or uh, a little more cautious in the recommendations that we make for diet and at least acknowledge that for some of the things that we're recommending, we have to have an acknowledgement of the uncertainty because we don't have randomized controlled trials, which would be the gold standard for evaluating the effects of an intervention on a health outcome. I wonder if this contributes to what we hear people saying, well, you hear this one day in the news, and then the next day, it's something else. You know, coffee is good for you, coffee is bad for you. I wonder if, if it's a lot of this observational research that is contributing to a little bit of confusion there. But also, as we spoke, you know, randomized control trials aren't possible for every type of research. And then you also mentioned expressing maybe some of the uncertainty. I'd like you to speak to that as a researcher, because from a scientific standpoint, that makes perfect sense to us. You know, nothing's 100%. You've always got the strength of the statistics, or this is what we looked at, here's what else needs to be considered. But to the public, it just doesn't translate in a positive way. That's true. There's always a balance. So on the one hand, you want simple messages because the public will respond to simple messages. On the other hand, life isn't always as simple as we'd like to make it out to be. And so sometimes simple messages can be counterproductive if later on we find out that that message was too simple and the reality is more complicated. And a great example of that was in the 1980s, there was a big focus on reducing dietary fat intake. Now, one could argue that the focus should have been on reducing dietary saturated fat intake and not total fat intake. But the total fat intake reduction message was simpler. And so that's what was used, you know, reduce your intake of total fat. 
and the objective was to improve health. Well, here's the problem. Whenever you lower something in the diet, you're going to replace it with something else. And what people tended to replace fat with was sugar. And so we had unintended consequences with people lowering fat intake, increasing sugar intake, and unfortunately that probably contributed to some adverse health outcomes that were related to that shift in macronutrient composition. And so today the message is much more about lowering saturated fat, replacing it with unsaturated fats. And, you know, that message was really viewed as uh, too complicated and the attempt to simplify it probably resulted in, you know, suboptimal results. Mm -hmm. Oh, that was a really great example. And I know that there's a lot of oversimplification going on. And I talk about this a lot on the podcast. When you're trying to communicate to the masses, it's a big challenge for our field, but it's also a big pet peeve of mine when things just get oversimplified and they kind of lose their meaning. And in this current coronavirus COVID-19 era, I've been seeing a lot of mixed messages and oversimplification of the science of what is known. Certainly there's a lot that's unknown, but I feel, you know, from a healthcare messaging standpoint, I'm very frustrated. (laughs) Yes, in fact, I've been spending most of my time over the last few months on COVID-19 and SARS-CoV-2, you know, research and designing studies and so forth. And it is a challenge because people want simple messages. I understand that. But sometimes the answer has to be, we're not sure. And that's very unsatisfying to people because they want you to tell them exactly Mm -hmm. what they should do. And sometimes the answer is, well give me a few months and I'll be able to tell you that. But right now we're not sure and we have to be humble and acknowledge that we're not sure. Yes. And, you know, you and I participated in a risk communication webinar years ago. And I know we talked about some of this during that webinar. When I say participated, we both presented on this webinar with Dr. Roger Clemens. And, you know, I think one of the takeaways, it's about building that trust. So if you can be more clear. Yeah, people don't want to hear that there's uncertainty and you don't know. But if you're honest and clear about that, then they may not like it, but that seems to build more trust. But if you're trying to oversimplify or shape the message in a way that, look, this is what you need to know right now. And then you have to backpedal later, like, should you wear masks or not? I'm not going to get on that soapbox. But then, you know, it kind of makes people go, hmm, well, you told me one thing before, now I don't know if I trust you. And it kind of breeds that distrust and that can cause a lot of problems. That's true. And so it's always a balance between doing the best that you can, acknowledging what you don't know, and not coming off in such a way that the takeaway is going to be, well, they don't know anything. And so why should I listen to them? Because, you know, they just keep telling us we don't know. And things are going to change in a couple of weeks anyway, so I just am going to tune out. Exactly. That's what we don't want. We don't want people tuning out. And that's why I like to talk about the different types of research and talk with people like you who are on the front lines, because you know about half my audience are healthcare professionals, the other half are not. But anybody listening, I think the more that you understand the complexities You may not remember, I don't even know all the terminology, but the more you understand the complexities, the more you can appreciate when you do hear something in the news, that it's not, boom, the stamp of 100% certainty, and that it's adding to that whole body of research. So, Absolutely. So what else would you like to share regarding this article? What we tried to do was offer some perspective, because our view was that dietary recommendations had become too reliant on observational evidence without adequately expressing the uncertainty when the evidence is primarily from observational evidence. And having said that, I think that there's been some shift and the dietary guidelines for Americans are you know, being prepared now. Uh, there's always a dietary ad- guidelines advisory committee of scientists that reviews the evidence and then makes recommendations. And then those recommendations are incorporated into the document, but not always uh, exactly as is recommended. And so I think that our objective was to make more people who are involved in nutrition science and policy 
aware of some of these limitations so that in future versions of the Dietary Guidelines for Americans, there could be greater acknowledgement and greater awareness of the limitations of observational evidence. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Right. And the strength and the weight of certain types of research or certain research studies should carry more weight than others. Absolutely. As I said, we have relatively few studies of disease incidence, and PREDIMED is one example of a study that was well-designed and well-conducted and you know, gave a pretty strong, compelling a set of results to support you know, a Mediterranean diet pattern you know, focusing on nuts uh, and or olive oil. I wish we had many more of these, but unfortunately, uh, we don't. And so we have to work with the best evidence that we have available. And in this article, you share some examples with regard to B vitamin supplementation, homocysteine, and coronary heart disease risk, also antioxidant vitamin supplementation and coronary heart disease risk, and polyunsaturated fat, Mediterranean diet. Is this article available, if I put the link or a PDF in the show notes at soundbitesrd.com, is this article available for people to review? That's a good question. The abstract is certainly available. I don't know offhand whether or not it's open access so that anyone can view it. Certainly those with a subscription to the journal can, or if people have access to the journal through an institution for which they work, they would be able to access it that way. But I'm not certain that it's available to everyone. Okay. Well, I can check into that. And certainly, like you said, the abstract will be available and we can share that. So I will follow up on that. As we're wrapping up, pulling all of this together, I'd like to hear about what you're working on moving forward and also your thoughts on dietary changes, uh, lifestyle changes when it comes to making changes for the long term. I'd just love to hear your thoughts on that. Research in mind. Well, my research for years and years has been focused on how we can eat in such a way that keeps our risk of chronic disease low, and then what else we can do. So I used to talk about diet and exercise and not smoking as you know, the important key lifestyle variables. And now I've added sleep to that. So Mm. diet, exercise, good sleep, and not smoking are key elements of a healthy lifestyle. And we have a lot to learn about diet. And we have a lot to learn about different individuals and how they may respond differently to various dietary interventions. So someone who is insulin resistant, for instance, might have one type of diet that works better for his or her situation, whereas someone else who's not insulin resistant may respond better to a different type of diet. So I think Mm -hmm. there's a lot to learn about that. There's a lot to learn about things like gut microbiota and how they're influencing health and influencing our responses to diet. And in terms of lifestyle, I think that especially in the medical profession, Lifestyle gets lip service, but it often doesn't get the attention it really deserves. And part of the reason for that is when physicians especially look at the effects of drugs versus the effect of lifestyle, they say, "Eh, you know, lifestyle doesn't look like it has that substantial an effect. And, you know, if somebody's cholesterol is a bit high, if I keep pounding about lifestyle and, you know, nudging them on lifestyle, that might alienate the person and I'll just give them a statin that'll lower the cholesterol level dramatically. And so, you know, certainly there's a place for pharmaceuticals, but I think the potential benefits of lifestyle are underestimated in part because they're relatively modest, but modest changes maintained over a long period of time can have very important health effects. So if you look at cholesterol levels, for instance, If you look at genetic variants that have very tiny effects to raise or lower cholesterol levels, over time, we see that those genetic variants are associated with higher or lower risk. So similarly, if you alter lifestyle in a way that lowers the LDL cholesterol level by just a few percentage points, if maintained over decades, Mm -hmm. that might have a very important benefit. So looking at statin drugs, for instance, Every 39 milligram per deciliter reduction in LDL cholesterol lowers risk of cardiovascular disease by about 22% over five years. But if we look at the same degree of reduction, if maintained over decades, we probably get a much larger 
benefit. And that would be supported by results from studies of genetic variants that do just that. And so I want to emphasize that healthy eating, exercise, and modification of risk factors, even if the effects are very small, can have very important effects over a long period, just like starting to save earlier for retirement will have big payoffs later on in life, even though what is saved early might be a relatively small amount. What you save early grows into a much bigger amount at uh, the end of several decades than much larger amounts of savings later on. Similarly with diet, you make small changes, they have small effects on risk factors, and that translates into big benefits later on. Mm -hmm. I love that analogy. And I think that dietitians, registered dietitian nutritionists, you know, we know that these small changes do add up. And certainly, that's the work we do every day, um, helping kind of coach people and empower people to make these little changes and sustain them over time and trying to get them out of that mindset of, well, I have to do something drastic to see drastic changes, but then I can't stick with it. And that's one of the reasons I love working with people with diabetes, because some of these small changes, you really do see huge impact. I don't know if this is one of the only health conditions where the nutrition intervention can be just as effective as first line prescription therapy. So that's really exciting to see. And people can monitor their blood sugars and see a huge improvement. And they feel so much better. And I think with something like weight or cardiovascular disease, you don't have some of those more powerful, immediate results that that you can see and feel. And I think that's an important element of lifestyle change is to give people feedback. So what I recommend to people if they make a diet change or if they start an exercise program or what have you, I say, well, let's get your blood drawn before you do that. And then let's draw your blood to look at your lipid profile, for instance, you know, after two weeks or after a month. And the, you know, refrain I often get is, well, is that enough time to see changes? Well, the answer is it is enough time to see initial changes. And it really helps keep the person motivated to stick with those changes because that feedback is very reinforcing. Exactly. So got to get a dietitian involved with all these people. Absolutely. (laughs) Easier said than done, but physicians refer. Okay. Well, thank you for sharing that. We want to make changes that we can stick with. You know, we're going to say this over and over again, help people make these changes they can stick with over time and even in our own lives. One of the resources that I have to share with the listeners is a one pager handout that talks about the new diabetes and heart health research and what the researchers did, what the study takeaways and results were. So that's a one pager that I'll have on the show notes at soundbitesrd.com. And then I'll have whatever other articles and publications that we talked about today that are available or information on how to get them. And also, I don't want to forget to include the information about marinating meats and cooking meats properly. Beefitswhat'sfordinner.com. It's a great resource with all kinds of recipes and cooking tips. So I wanted to share that as well. Terrific. Well, thank you again, Dr. Mackey, for coming on the show and discussing all things research related and about this new diabetes and heart health research. It's very exciting. And like I said, I'll have all the information in the show notes at soundbitesrd.com. And people can find you on LinkedIn. So I will have a link to that as well. It's been a pleasure catching up with you. It's been a while. It's been a pleasure. Great to uh, talk with you again. And uh, Hope your audience uh, finds the research useful in their practices. Thank you. And for everybody listening, as always, enjoy your food with health in mind. Till next time. For more information, visit soundbitesrd.com. Music by Dave Burke, produced by JAG in Detroit Podcasts. 